do 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 Alright, get back to New Haven, craft some hull upgrades, rethink this whole strategy. Boy, ferret! The idiot's drowning himself in the bathtub again! Subnautica. Go buy it. This is quite possibly one of the best of the crafting exploration games I have ever played. It uses an incredible alien world that it naturally encourages you to explore and learn more about as you progress. It also manages to perfectly encapsulate the fear and dread of the deep ocean while playing on our natural human curiosity. The game doesn't hold your hand and there are several times where you'll need to explore on your own to find progress, but it also sets out goals. The giant crashed main ship needs to be explored, a rescue ship is coming to this location, a radio signal from a fellow survivor provides a beacon to their location. Even when the game isn't holding your hand, it's not hard to find something to push your discovery further. The first time I got left alone with no clear goal, I just needed to get over my own fear and delve a little bit deeper into the beautiful mushroom caves to find out more about the survivors who had come before me and show me what I needed to be doing. Well. Show me might be a bit strong. Give me a vague enough idea to help me work up the courage to explore further and deeper. It really does take courage, too. Subnautica is absolutely beautiful, but it's also absolutely terrifying. It might not look at it watching footage of the game, but when you are so small and helpless compared to everything else, the entire ocean becomes scary and the game is a master of knocking you down just as you start to get confidence. Oh, you finally don't think kelp doggos are scary? Here's a faster, angrier sand doggo. Well, they're not scary either anymore. How about an enormous purple worm with fangs the same size as you? Oh, I see you've gotten used to being able to just hop into your personal submarine you made and run away. It'd be a real shame if there was a monster that could teleport you out of that safety and into its claws. I had been feeling so confident leading up to my first encounter with a warper, and within seconds, I went from, oh, new thing, I'll just back off and get a quick look at its behavior, to an all-out flat panic. I refused to go into that trench again for hours after that just to avoid the warper, and even once I was forced to go down there for new resources to progress, it was hours and hours more until I stopped constantly looking over my shoulder. Even at the end of the game, seeing a warper's distinct effect in the water nearby was enough to induce mild terror. Oh, what's that? You've learned how to avoid the warpers for the most part and explore? Be a real shame if we made you remember what fear is. I'd gotten comfortable with being underwater. My oxygen tank was huge. The seameth that I'd made was a limitless supply of oxygen that I could always escape to, and it was so tough it could tank hits from even the enormous eels. I'd taken the moth deeper than ever before into this fascinating little cave to explore a ruin left behind by survivors before me. Life was great. I'd avoided all the warpers. I left the lights on in the moth to help me guide my way around the jellyfish that had taken over the abandoned structure. As I was inside, a screaming screech shook the structure and a wave of electricity pulsed through the walls in my body. The lights of the moth blinked out hit by the EMP. I swam to a window trying to figure out what was going on only to see an enormous biomechanical abomination of octopus and crab. As I stared the moth's lights flickered back on and another EMP promptly extinguished them. I started to swim back towards the crack in the walls that I'd gotten into the structure with. I wish I could play you th this clip, but there was just so much that would have been downloaded of my time down there, and I didn't have the space at the time. I started to come out of the structure only for the thing to swoop over my head. As I ducked back down, I looked up at my poor moth and physically asked out loud in the stream, Moth, are you okay? Only for an explosion to rock the structure. I floated there, shocked, as pieces of my only way back to the surface drifted down around me. Satisfied, the creature swam away, pleased with its work. I was now hundreds of feet below the surface, 
and didn't even know how to get back. My oxygen would never hold out. I'd already used too much time exploring the structure. I was left to slowly drown to death, unable to get back to safety. I was never again as confident as I had been in those depths. There is so much detail that went into every part of the game. I don't know how some players can go through the game never building a scanner room. I never would have found some resources without that. The developers, having actually crafted a map instead of having a map that is generated by a computer, makes a difference. It feels natural and you realize as you play that you're learning the map without even thinking about it. I've seen some complaints about not having a directional map, and I can definitely see and understand that. We're living in a world where technology is so impressive that I can feed raw materials into a Star Trek style fabricator and get an entire functional rocket ship, yet I can't get a functioning map of places I've already been to. Equally though, I think the lack of a map is very important. You can place markers wherever you go and name them something that will remind you of how to get there. Old Haven, New Haven, uh, Death Island, Floaty Jellyfish Island, The Way Out, Oh Sweet God No, whatever you want to name them. This also tells you where something is in the vertical plane, not just the horizontal. Maps are great if your world is able to be interacted with only one way, but water levels are hated in most games for exactly that reason. How are you supposed to read a map with layers and caves? Even in the real world, topographical maps only really show one layer. They would show you the entrance to the cave, and then they would show you the cave itself. And even when showing a cave map, it's sometimes very difficult if there's a downward shaft and sections of cave that exist underneath each other, where they have to almost cut the map and make another map off to the side with a little guide showing you where it splits off. But in a world where you are meant to enter caves, where your final destination is almost a thousand meters underground, what good would a map do you? I might even argue a map would be negative to the experience as you try to follow the map and get frustrated that you're lost instead of trying to learn the world to stop being lost. And when you're not staring at a map, you really will learn your way around. I thought I barely knew the world, but as I sit here thinking about it for this script, I realize that I know the world much better than I thought I did. If I was ever to crash down on that same reef again, I roughly know how to get to everything again, even some of the stuff I never actually found until the end of the story when I was taking portals. What the game could do with is a bit more direction. The story progression of seeing what the previous survivors accomplished ends far above the end of the game. They have repeatedly said that you need to get to the deeper parts of the ocean, and that becomes your goal pushing forwards. Keep exploring, keep going deeper, and as I went deeper and deeper, I finally did find what I was looking for. I'm doing my best not to really spoil anything because I want anyone who hasn't experienced Subnautica to see it for themselves. But it was incredible. The thing I'd been looking for, surrounded by a lake of lava, rock juice doggos, mingling with the lava warpers, and an enormous creature that had once again reminded me of the definition of terror by grabbing me and treating my alien style mecha spacesuit like a chew toy. I approached the entrance to the new area with trepidation only to be locked out. There was another area that I had to find first. Such an area had been at some point been speculatively mentioned by the logs I'd read, but I had no idea where it was, what depth it was at, what biome it was in, I knew nothing. For the first time in the game, my entire game plan turned into wander until you run into something undefined in an undefined place that could look like any place that you have already been. And wander I did for almost three hours of nothing. And when I did find it, it was entirely at random and I felt like I'd just simply gotten excessively lucky. And don't get me wrong, finding it was really cool. A tunnel marked by special structures involved in what I was looking for, only to find a structure floating in the water held up by pipes and cables inside of a deep cave, a lake of lava below it. But getting there was the only moment that the game incorporated everything that I usually hate about this style of game. Having no reason to explore an area with an idea of what you were looking for just for the sake of looking. Then again, that was about three hours out of over 30, so I don't know that it's all that bad. What I know was much worse was the glitches. 
In particular, there was one glitch that became absolutely intolerable. When you are moving inside of the special structures I mentioned, you are absolutely tiny compared to the area. You feel like you're moving so slowly and everything towers above you. Luckily, your mecha suit is built for use in and out of water. It's even built for space. Not that you, you know, get to use it in space, but that's still really cool. It was called a prawn suit, so I nicknamed mine Shrimp. It almost requires that you are in the shrimp when exploring these areas. If you want to get around them in a timely fashion, that is. Heck, there are special resource deposits deep in some of them that can only be harvested by using the shrimp's drill arm. And that's fine. You are interacting with something special. You should want to use your special suit. But the suit and the map do not play nice. Any kind of incline on the floor, a wall texture, a slight bump on the ground that is essentially a piece of decorative molding on a floor, you will become irrevocably stuck to it. You can now either abandon your shrimp here for the rest of eternity, or you will have to get out of the shrimp, save, and reload your game. While exploring the final special structure, I could not play for longer than half an hour without this happening, often much less. Oh, and whatever you do, do not get out of the shrimp first. If you don't actually get out of the shrimp, the glitches ascend. Part of me says I should go back to Death House, make... Oh, not this glitch again! When I finish Subnautica... Oh, we're in. Oh, I am inside of the floor. What? Um... What happens if I get out? Oh, I'm still on the floor. I'm still in the floor! Oh, I'm very stuck! Oh, I'm very stuck! Fascinating floor! Uh... Oh. Oh. Oh, I fell through a seam. Oh my! Hmm. Ah! Um. Hi, fish. On a list of problems, this one's pretty high. I don't... Oh. I mean, I can get my, uh, thing working again. Well... Tilt. 
interesting. I appear to have entered the void. Fascinating. Here we go again. Oh, oh no, 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 no. No, 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 stop bouncing, stop bouncing, stop bouncing, stop bouncing, stop bouncing. Oh, Lord. Oh, no. The prawn still thinks I'm inside. Nope. That's not going to work. Get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. Okay, I successfully got out. This problem is incredibly annoying, and I'm kind of frustrated that despite it being a known issue, it was never fixed. It has an easy player fix, though, and was never a problem while I was out of the water, so I don't know how upset I can be overall when there's so much else going on in this well-crafted world. Beyond that, I think having completed the game, my only other nitpick is that I want an option to not leave the planet. Which, yes, I know that option's called Don't Finish the Game. But when our society that we're returning to seems deeply corrupt, and when returning comes with trillions of dollars of debt that I'm required to pay before I'm even allowed to land, why would I ever go back? I can either be trapped in isolation, circling my home planet forever, or I can choose to live in isolation on a beautiful planet with my adorable pet fish for company. Which, smart corporation, if I had landed, I would make a fuss about you destroying the life of a survivor of a crash that was your fault. When I can't ever do more than enter orbit, I'm not a threat. I just want to stay on this world forever. Wow. I know it might be argued that I'm biased. I love underwater games. I've gotten enjoyment out of games that were objectively poorly designed, boring, etc. just because they were set underwater. But this is far and above one of the best games, if not possibly the best experience that I've had since I started this channel. Go out, give it a try, let yourself get drawn into this incredible world. Especially since the team that made this is working on a new game, Below Zero. It looks like it uses a lot of the same mechanics and equipment, but in a new setting and a new world with a new story. I don't know if it's on the same planet or if it's on another planet in the same universe, but oh, I cannot wait to pick it up and get going on that one. Oh man, the Subnautica review already, and a review in a somewhat timely fashion. Hopefully you all enjoyed this one. Um, I'm still not sure what I think of the new camera, but we're working on moving forward with everything. So until next time, have a great day, and remember, life is always another game waiting to be discovered.